So I want to thank Dysautonomy International for inviting me to do this talk today. I'm going to be talking about recent updates on dysautonomia and Ehlers-Danlos syndromes. As Lauren said, I'm currently a postdoctoral fellow at Penn State College of Medicine. What a postdoc means is I recently got my PhD degree, but I'm not a professor yet, but I hope to be in a couple years. A little more about me is I began studying POTS when I was a college student. Shortly after I was diagnosed with POTS and hypermobile EDS, I decided I wanted to continue to do research on this topic, um, and then I wanted to build that into a career. So I got a PhD in neuroscience in 2017. Um, I study a few things besides POTS, mainly because there isn't enough funding to study POTS full time. But my POTS research focuses on mechanisms of cognitive impairment, vascular dysfunction, and connections between POTS and other comorbid conditions. I was invited to do this webinar because I recently published two papers on dysautonomia and Ehlers Danlos syndrome in January 2016. 20. The first paper is called Arterial Elasticity in Ehlers-Danlos Syndromes. And this was published in a journal called Genes um, as part of a special issue on mechanisms of Ehlers-Danlos Syndromes. This paper um, actually took me about three years to publish, and it was a very long process. Um, the second paper was a study we did at the 2018 Dysautonomia International Conference. We looked at the prevalence of hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome in people with postural tachycardia syndrome. And this was recently published as a short report in the journal Autonomic Neuroscience. So the graphic um, on the right really shows how long it takes from starting a study to finish. I think it's sometimes hard to see as patients you think that research isn't moving fast enough. But to get all the data, analyze it, formulate it into a paper and then get it into the peer review process actually takes a lot of time. I think this figure does overestimate that time a little bit um, because in the past four years, I've actually published about 17 papers. Not all of these were on POTS though, only about five of them were. I really wish I could study POTS full time. Um, but like I said, there, there's not enough funding for me to do that. You also have to remember that most people in this field of POTS research are also physicians who are seeing patients all, most of their time. So they have even less time to do research. And we really just need more people in this field if we want some answers about uh, and eventually a cure for dysautonomia. I also have one more paper that is currently in the peer review process. What that means is after you submit a paper to a journal, the editors of that journal send the paper to other experts in the field who basically get to tear that paper apart and suggest you make any change that they want, <laughs> that they feel is necessary to improve that paper. So uh, we're currently waiting for this paper. Um, it's entitled Cognitive Function is Impaired in During Active Standing and Postural Tachycardia Syndrome. Um, I'm not actually going to discuss the data from this today unless I have time. I do have some slides on cognition at the end. This is also from a study we did at the 2018 Dysautonomia International Patient Conference. So if we have time, I'll talk a little bit about cognition, but we're really gonna focus on Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome today. Okay. My objectives for this webinar are first that you understand that Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and dysautonomia commonly co-occur, if you weren't aware of that. We're also going to discuss the possible relationships between EDS and dysautonomia. I like to refer to this as the chicken or egg question. We don't know which is the chicken or the egg or whether that matters. Um, we're also, I'm going to discuss briefly about management of comorbid dysautonomia and EDS. My main reference for discussing Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome is uh, the 2017 consensus criteria. I've heard that this will be updated again in uh, 2020, so this, uh, this might be shortly out of date, but this is our current updated classification for EDS. 
I'm also going to refer to the hypermobile EDS diagnostic checklist. So I figured I'd, I'd paste a link here in this webinar. If you go to the Eller Stanlis Society website, it's pretty, pretty easy to find this. So first, I'm going to explain what Eller Stanlis syndrome is for those who aren't aware. Um, it's a heritable disorder of connective tissue characterized by joint hypermobility, skin hyperextensibility, and tissue fragility. Ehlers-Danlos syndrome um, is pretty rare, but there are three more common types. The first one is hypermobile EDS. It was formerly referred to as type 3 or EDS hypermobility type. It affects about 1 in 5,000 people, but uh, those estimates could be a little off. This is the most common form in POTS, and there is no gene associated with it yet. So this form is truly hereditary or inherited. Um, but if there is a gene or genes, we haven't found them yet. The next form is classical EDS, which was formerly referred to as type 1 and 2 EDS. This affects about 1 in 20,000 people. And there are a few different genetic mutations associated with this form. Uh, but the most common one is a mutation in the collagen 5A1 gene, which encodes for type 5 collagen. Then there's the vascular form of EDS, which is formerly referred to as type 4, which affects 1 in 50,000 to 1 in 200,000 people. The most common genetic mutation in this form is mutation in type 3 collagen. There are actually 14 types of EDS. The last time I presented this, there were 13 types. So there, there uh, more types are continuously being identified. And most of these, uh, these three common, more common types of EDS have an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern, which means that if a parent has EDS, their child has a 50% chance of also having it. My research really focuses on hypermobile EDS, which I think uh, is the least understood type, but also the more it, it is also the most common. It's actually the most common hereditary disorder of connective tissue, because there are a few others besides EDS. There's no known gene for this, um, and I think the estimate of one in 5,000 is an underestimate. This is characterized by joint hypermobility um, and instability, tissue fragility, and chronic widespread pain. There's also a strong link between hypermobile EDS and POTS. Hypermobile EDS is the most common type of EDS in people with POTS. And people with hypermobile EDS actually have more dysautonomia symptoms than people with other types of EDS. So you might be wondering um, if you have joint hypermobility, but you don't have hypermobile EDS, what, is, what does that mean? So with the 2017 reclassification of Ehlers-Danlos syndromes, some patients who were previously diagnosed with EDS um, don't meet the diagnostic criteria anymore. And this new diagnosis of hypermobility spectrum disorders was termed. This was formerly known um, as joint hypermobility syndrome, and they just gave it a new name. Um, but now more people actually fall into this category than previously. This is a continuum of asymptomatic joint hypermobility all the way to hypermobile EDS. It's important to note that people with hypermobility spectrum disorders can actually have severe life-altering symptoms and necessitate care even if they don't meet the EDS label. So what's important is getting the proper diagnosis and treatment, not really the label. The overlap between POTS and EDS was actually published 20 years ago. Um, my former mentor, Dr. Rowe at Johns Hopkins, found that 12 out of 100 adolescents in his clinic for chronic fatigue syndrome and orthostatic intolerance also had EDS. So that was definitely more than the one in 5,000 in the population. Since then, there have been many other estimates. Anywhere from 15 to 50% of people with POTS are estimated to have EDS. However, these previous studies were based on questionnaires or retrospective chart reviews, which leads to incomplete and inconsistent analysis. 
So basically not everyone in, this, in these studies were evaluated for EDS and we don't know how they were evaluated and what criteria were used. This figure comes from a recent review actually on mast cell activation disorder, but I think it shows the overlap between symptoms of hypermobile EDS, POTS, and mast cell activation really well. I highlighted, I circled in red um, the overlap between hypermobile EDS and POTS specifically. We know that about two thirds of people with EDS have orthostatic intolerance. About half of these patients meet the diagnostic criteria for POTS. The others uh, may have syncope or just undefined orthostatic intolerance. We also know that hypermobile EDS patients have worse autonomic symptoms than people with other types of EDS. About 10 to 40 percent of POTS patients have EDS. Um, based on previous studies, most of these have hypermobile EDS and some have classical. However, like, uh, like I said, these are based on retrospective chart review, um, reviews and large questionnaire-based studies. So we don't know if all patients were evaluated and how they were evaluated. So you might be wondering, do I have EDS? Um, maybe you're in this webinar and you have POTS, but you haven't been diagnosed with EDS yet. Uh, you really have to look at the EDS-specific symptoms in this chart because there is a big overlap between POTS and hypermobile EDS. So briefly, the symptoms that are specific to EDS are really, for the hypermobile type, are chronic joint pain and joint instability. Um, a lot of people with hypermobile EDS were previously gymnasts or dancers due to their hyperflexibility. However, alone that is not, um, not all gymnasts and dancers have it. Um, for skin, if there's easy bruising or scarring or stretchy, termed doughy skin, uh, that can be a sign that hypermobile EDS might be present. Also, if there are cardiovascular findings, such as echo um, cardiography findings of mitral valve prolapse or aortic root dilation, those can also be signs for hypermobile EDS. And of course, if there's a family history of early cardiovascular death, an evaluation for uh, vascular EDS should be performed. Hernias can also be assigned, um, aside from hiatal hernias, which are pretty common in the general population. So I, I like to make the argument um, for EDS diagnosis, if hypermobile EDS is what is suspected, um, going to a geneticist is not always necessary. I know some EDS experts and some POTS experts will disagree with me on this. However, most geneticists do not want to see patients with hypermobile EDS because there's no gene they can test. And if you can get to an EDS specialist, often there's a very long wait list. So my argument is if you think you have hypermobile EDS, you should find a physician who is familiar with it and willing to evaluate. So the Eller Stanlow Society made this diagnostic checklist, which I'll go over in a minute, that was designed for doctors or really medical practitioners of any type across all disciplines to be able to diagnose EDS. However, I'll make the caveat here that if vascular or classical EDS is suspected, referring to a geneticist for genetic testing um, should be done. And the reasons you would suspect these types is if there's a personal or family history of unusual scarring severe skin stretchiness, so people who can stretch their skin several inches, um, or a personal or family history of vascular rupture, including aortic aneurysm, or really car cardiovascular death at a young age for any reason. But if it's just hypermobile EDS that is suspected, um, that can be evaluated by a variety of practitioners, not just geneticists. This is what the diagnostic checklist looks like. It's a one-page form. Um, you could find this on the Eller Stanless Society website, print it out and bring it to a medical practitioner. I can't promise that they'll receive that well and be willing to evaluate you for hypermobile EDS, but it's worth a try, um, especially if they're if they're treating you for POTS or something or one of the comorbidities. 
It has three parts to it that I'll go over briefly. The first part is evaluating generalized joint hypermobility, which is based on the Biden scale, basically how far you can stretch joints. Criterion two goes over systemic features, family history, and musculoskeletal involvement, so basically joint pain. And criterion three is the exclusion criteria, so ruling out other types of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, other connective tissue disorders, autoimmune conditions, and neuromuscular conditions that can be similar. And you must meet all three of these criteria to be able to be diagnosed with hypermobile EDS. So these are some treatment considerations based on expert consensus and not very much data on POTS um, and EDS. I wanna make it clear that I'm not a clinician, I do not see patients, and I don't have any experience with actually treating patients with POTS or EDS. However, these are some, some things I've heard at meetings for arguments for how people with EDS and dysautonomia should be treated a little bit differently in their care. So there's some data that EDS, uh, people with EDS might be more sensitive to side effects from pharmacological treatments. And this is especially true if they have mast cell activation syndrome or immune hypersensitivity. So even small doses of medications can have uh, more side effects in this population compared to most patients. There is a rumor that is based on no data that mitodrin works well in EDS patients. I think this goes along with the leading theory that I'll get into in a bit, that EDS causes stretchy veins um, that don't vasoconstrict well, and that's why people think mitodrin works well. It may work well, but no one has actually published that. I found in a recent study um, where we were assessing the prevalence of hypermobile EDS in POTS that less people with comorbid EDS in POTS take beta blockers compared to POTS patients without EDS. I don't know why this is, but I think that necessitates further study. It could be that beta blockers don't work as well in people with POTS and EDS, or it could just be that they're not prescribed as often, maybe because other treatments are prescribed. So I think that's something interesting that deserves further study, but I, I can't tell you for sure that beta blockers don't work as well. It's important in EDS to focus on movement. I like to refer to Newton's first law of physics here. I love physics. That's why I study physiology of the body. Uh, so bodies in motion stay in motion. So even if there's chronic pain and it's really hard to move, it's still important to keep moving so that you don't get deconditioned and the joints don't uh, get looser. We know that exercise is really important for dysautonomia, but exercises might have to be modified for people with EDS. Focusing on low impact exercise can be helpful. These include swimming, walking, biking, and elliptical. However, however, this can be different for different patients, and it's important for the patient to find something that doesn't damage their joints further. Some exercises to avoid are rowing and running and anything that can cause overstretching, like yoga and even Pilates. Um, physical therapy can also be key to EDS treatment. You can't um, improve the connective tissue with physical therapy, but what you can do is strengthen the muscles to support the joints so that they become less, um, less unstable. But it's important to find a therapist who's familiar with joint hypermobility and won't give the patient exercises that will cause overstretching. Sometimes manual physical therapy, like myofascial release, can be helpful to improve pain and stiffness as well because people with EDS actually have some stiffness um, in the muscles, even though they have loose joints. It's kind of counterintuitive. So the question I've, I've been wondering since I started research and I really want to address is how EDS and dysautonomia are related. Many people assume that EDS causes floppy veins, which leads to dysautonomia, but this is just a theory and before my study, there was actually no data to support that. So the short answer that I think is really important to um, tell patients is that we don't know. So um, 
there really needs to be more research to figure out what the connection is between these two syndromes. There are a couple myths about EDS and dysautonomia that I wanted to debunk first. So the first is that EDS causes dysautonomia or POTS. Like I said, this is a chicken and egg situation. EDS and POTS are both syndromes. They have overlapping symptoms and we don't know what comes first or if these symptoms are, um, are both part of another disease that causes both of them. Since these are both syndromes, they're not diseases with a known cause. So there could be another disease that is actually leading to this collection of symptoms. So you might think that since EDS is genetic and you were born with it, that must come first, right? And this may be true for other types of EDS, but for hypermobile EDS, which is what most people with dysautonomia have, if they have EDS, um, that runs in families, just like dysautonomia, but there's no gene associated with it yet. There are several studies trying to find this gene or genes, but so far there hasn't been um, there hasn't been a gene that's been present in most patients. It's also important to note that not everyone with hypermobile EDS has a family member with it. So it's not even always hereditary. There are many situations where this is the first case in a family. Mo many people with hypermobile EDS are actually pretty healthy in the, until they develop symptoms as teenagers, which is when the dysautonomia symptoms begin as well. So it's really hard to say that one syndrome causes the other. In fact, uh, one EDS expert I talked to said she would not diagnose EDS before age 12 because really all kids are hypermobile. And usually this is benign and, as and asymptomatic and they're normal children, they're just hypermobile. Um, also hypermobile EDS and dysautonomia are more prevalent in women. So if EDS was really autosomal dominant, in genetics, men and women would be affected equally, but that's not the case. Most people have hypermobile EDS are women, and men seem to be protected from it. And there's probably a hormonal link be behind both of these synd syndromes and their underlying causes, but we don't know what that is yet. So the third myth is that if I have EDS, my dysautonomia won't be won't get any better, and that's simply not true. First off, we don't know enough about long-term prognosis, prognosis of either of these syndromes. So we don't know how people do over time and if they get better or worse. And we need more research in, in that area. People with EDS often respond to treatments for their dysautonomia. And people with EDS also often grow out of their dysautonomia, especially if they developed it as a teenager. And that's similar to people without EDS who develop dysautonomia as teenagers. I'm an example of that as well. We also know that connective tissue stiffens with age, which might lead to symptomatic improvement in some patients for the dysautonomia and their EDS symptoms. There are several theories on the relationship between EDS and dysautonomia and why this exists. The first one is the most popular one, and this is that EDS dam damages the collagen that lines the arteries and the veins, which then makes those arteries and veins more floppy and leads to dysautonomia. The second is that the prevalence of autoimmune disease and small fiber neuropathy, which is autonomic nerve damage, um, is higher in EDS. There are a couple papers suggesting this, which could lead to dysautonomia. The third, this one doesn't have a lot of evidence, um, but there are some who believe that the mast cells that create a nonspecific immune response can damage both the connective tissue and the autonomic nerves. So it's possible that mast cell activation is mediating both of these syndromes, or maybe it's just another comorbidity. And the last one is that people with EDS have anxiety about standing, which leads to tachycardia and POTS. And yes, unfortunately, this is a published theory. So people really do believe it's anxiety. This is an excerpt from a paper that was published in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings in 2012. They said that um, hypermobile EDS is characterized 
by chronic pain. This might be disabling and cause anxiety and depression, which may lead to a hypersympathetic response triggered by fear of pain on standing. I know it's it's a little ridiculous, but people believe this. And then the this paper further went on to say that the hypothesis that the vascular that there is vascular damage in the connective tissue that leads to orthostatic tachycardia has not been convincingly tested. And this is why research is so important, so that you can debunk these theories and uh, theories that anxiety is underlying both these syndromes don't get perpetuated further. So that is the question I wanted to test. Are floppy veins the link between EDS and cardiovascular autonomic dysfunction and dysautonomia? And my first question about this was why had no one tested this? This theory was first proposed in 1999 when the connection was first found and took someone 20 years to publish data on it. Um, before I explain the study, I wanted to give you some background on cardiovascular physiology and why the veins and arteries and their elasticity or stretchiness is so important. So heart function is partially determined by the blood flow in the arteries and the veins. If the arteries are stretchy, um, the veins can pool a lot of blood that doesn't get returned to the heart efficiently. Um, and this can cause tachycardia or POTS because the heart is trying to beat faster to compensate for the lack of uh, central blood volume. You might be wondering, how do we measure the elasticity or stretchiness of the arteries? So I use this technique called pulse weight velocity, which has actually been around for uh, several decades. This is a non-invasive technique in which pressure probes are placed on the carotid artery in the neck and the femoral artery in the legs. And the, a machine calculates how fast waveforms travel between these two arteries. And you also measure the distance between these two sites. So you can um, calculate a velocity of how fast the blood is traveling between a certain distance. If the arteries are to are stretchy, blood travels slower or has a lower velocity. Um, and if the arteries are stiff, blood travels faster in these arteries because they're not stretching as much and you get a higher velocity. So most studies focus on if the arteries are too stiff. This actually is really bad. It predicts heart attack and cardiovascular death. Um, and this is because if the pulse waves travel too fast, blood doesn't return to the heart at the right time. So during diastole, when the heart is filling, and then the heart can't pump as much blood to the rest of the body. However, very few studies have looked at elastic arteries being good or bad. So usually papers just say that uh, stiff arteries are bad and elastic arteries are good. However, in people with EDS or dysautonomia, we don't know if arteries being too elastic is actually a good or bad thing. So in this study, I included 60 people with EDS who were um, in, enrolled in a study at the National Institute on Aging on connective tissue disorders. A subset of people from the study had their pulse wave velocity measured and their orthostatic vital signs were also measured. So they took blood pressure and heart rate, lying down, sitting and standing. And my first finding is that people with EDS had lower pulse wave velocity um, than the healthy people. So the EDS patients are in the zebra stripe bars and the healthy people are in the solid gray bars. And I separated by age ranges because the arteries naturally stiffen with age, at least in healthy humans. In EDS, there tends to be a slower rise in pulse wave velocity with age. So it's possible that uh, EDS patients are protected from this age-related stiffening of the arteries, um, but this could actually contribute to their symptoms as well, that the arteries are more elastic. This is actually the first evidence that arteries are more elastic in people with EDS. 
there were two previous studies in vascular EDS that showed that arteries were more elastic, but no one had tested this in hypermobile classical or other forms of EDS. I hypothesized that people with stretchier arteries would have more um, orthostatic hypotension or more orthostatic tachycardia because of that. However, that wasn't exactly the case. But what we did find is that people with more elastic arteries had lower blood pressure in lying down and seated postures. So it is possible that um, elastic arteries is part of the lower blood pressure observed in people with EDS. However, we can't assume causation here. This is just a correlation. And we did not see any change in the standing blood pressures and heart rate. My main conclusion from this study are that the arteries are more elastic in people with EDS of, with all types compared to a healthy population. We also found that uh, more, the more stretchy the arteries are, the lower the blood pressure, um, but this does not predict orthostatic blood pressure or heart rate in any of the postures. And artery, arteries also might be uh, more elastic or stretchier in people with POTS without EDS, and that has not been studied, and I would like to investigate that further. So it, this phenomenon of arterial elasticity may not be unique to EDS. So I'm going to talk about my second study, which uh, we performed at the Dysautonomia International Conference in 2018. This study actually had two goals, and we used the acronym SCOPE, or Standing Cognition and Comorbidities of POTS Evaluation. So I'm just going to start uh, talk about the comorbidities evaluation, and maybe I'll talk about the cognition part in a future webinar. So the first goal was to uh, assess the prevalence of HED, HEDS, hypermobile EDS in POTS, based on the 2017 diagnostic criteria, which no one had done before. We thought that maybe with this new criteria, not as many POTS patients would fall into this um, hypermobile EDS category, since the criteria remain more stringent. Oops. Okay. So we enrolled uh, attendees at the 2018 conference who were previously diagnosed with POTS by a medical provider. We did not test them for POTS as part of the study. We enrolled anyone 13 to 60 years old who was able to stand unassisted, since we were also testing standing cognition in the study. That was important. So I used this hypermobile, um, HED, um, hypermobile EDS diagnostic criteria checklist that I went over previously in this webinar. We had EDS expert physicians who were doing these evaluations. Again, this is what the form looks like. And there are three parts to this, uh, three criterion to this evaluation. We, we published how many POTS patients met each of these criteria individually. So overall, what we found is that one third of people with POTS who were evaluated in, in the study met the criteria for hypermobile EDS. This was specifically 28 out of 91 patients with POTS, or 31%. We also saw that the self-reported rate of EDS in the study was 42%. So there were 14 people who reported being diagnosed with hypermobile EDS previously, but did not meet the new criteria in our study. We also observed that more than half of people with POTS were met the criteria for um, significant joint hypermobility, which is criterion one of this checklist based on the Biden scale. So the prevalence of joint hypermobility or hypermobile spectrum disorders might be even higher in this population. Uh, criterion two, which is the systemic features, was met, also met by 41% uh, of participa participants in the study. And only six had a positive family history, but I think this is partially because uh, the positive family history of hypermobile EDS had to be based on the 2017 diagnostic criteria. And we did the study in 2018. So I think it, it was just that there wasn't enough time 
for people to have a family member who was diagnosed with EDS uh, in, within the last year. However, uh, it's also possible that people with POTS don't have family members who, um, who have hypermobile EDS, and these are de novo or new cases that are occurring. And I think that deserves some further study. We could definitely use some family studies on both of these syndromes. My conclusions from this study are that about one third of POTS patients meet the diagnostic criteria for hypermobile EDS based on 2017 criteria. And 22% in addition to this have significant joint hypermobility without any meeting the hypermobile EDS criteria specifically. We also found that many participants previously diagnosed with hypermobile EDS did not meet the new criteria and may fall into the hypermobile, hypermobility spectrum disorders category. And I also make the argument from the study, a reviewer didn't like it too much, but I think that the estimate of hypermobile EDS in the general population of one in 5,000 is not accurate. Since we know that POTS affects about 1% of the population, if one third of those people have hypermobile EDS as well, the estimate for hypermobile EDS being rare um, is definitely an underestimate. So some takeaway points to my lecture are that uh, our webinar today is that EDS and dysautonomia often coexist, but research does not confirm that one causes the other. The main findings from my recent research are that the arteries are more elastic in people with EDS, and this was related to lower blood pressure. And approximately one third of people with POTS also have hypermobile EDS based on current criteria. So that's all I'm going to present today. I want to acknowledge everyone who's helped with these studies at the Dysautonomia International Conference, as well as um, my EDS connective tissue research team. Most importantly, I, wa I want to thank all my study participants um, and the donors to the Dysautonomia International POTS Research Fund, because without, uh, without either of those groups of people, research on these on these conditions would not be possible. And I also want to thank Dysautonomia International for all their support and for hosting this webinar today. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, we can take some questions. We have about 20 minutes uh, until we wrap up. And um, at all of our webinar guests can type questions. If you look on your dashboard um, for the webinar panel, there's there should be a place to type in some questions. And we ask that people try not to ask uh, like personal medical questions. Um, we try to keep the questions general, like things that would be of interest to lots of people. So um, the first question, I'm gonna ask Amanda, and I might assist with the answer if you want me to, Amanda. <laughs> Can people have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome with a positive ganglionic acetylcholine receptor antibody? Yes, that is, that is possible. So small fiber neuropathy um, and is pretty common in EDS. I know that doesn't answer it specifically, but basically I'm getting at, none of these mechanisms are mutually exclusive. So the, we haven't tested the prevalence of adrenergic or ganglia or, or acetylcholine um, antibodies in people with EDS specifically, but it's possible that this is part of the mechanism. Lauren, do you wanna to add to this? Yeah, I would agree with that statement. And I would also add to it that um, we know that about 5% of the general population has low positive titers of the ganglionic acetylcholine receptor antibody. This antibody in high titers is associated with autoimmune autonomic ganglionopathy, which is like a very, very severe thing that um, is has some overlaps with POTS, but is considered a different illness than POTS. And um, we do know also that EDS, I remember seeing a presentation from Dr. Kazim, who's one of the GI specialists who sees a lot of EDS patients in the UK. And um, I, don't quote me exactly on this, but I think it was like a study of celiac patients and about a third of them met the EDS criteria and a study of Crohn's disease patients, about a third of them met the EDS criteria. So um, 
I'm not sure if that just means EDS is present in about a third of humans, or if it means EDS is present in a third of people with complicated chronic illness, or there's an association with autoimmunity. I don't think any of us know, but you certainly can have two unusual complicated medical conditions for sure. I think we see that a lot in the dysautonomia population. Um, let's see. Uh, so someone, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but someone's asking, has there been research done on the veins in EDS and if veins are, are, of people with EDS are more elastic? So that's harder to assess. I'm actually, uh, I want to study that and I'm, I'm submitting some grants to be able to study that. So the answer is no, as far as I, I'm aware. No one has looked at the, it's called venous compliance or venous stretchiness in people with EDS. There are some studies in POTS that show venous compliance um, is increased, but uh, those were done by Julian Stewart about a decade ago. Um, and there were probably people with EDS in that study, but unfortunately uh, that wasn't evaluated as part of that study. So I would like to investigate that further. Yeah, and just to clarify, because there are some people who are sort of newer to all the medical terminology, um, mm -hmm. some people use the word veins to mean all of the blood vessels, but Amanda, can you just really quickly clarify for people, what's the difference between an artery and a, a vein? Um, so arteries carry oxygenated blood from the heart to the rest of the body, and veins return blood from the rest of the body to the lungs. Uh, to be oxygen, they carry deoxygenated blood to get oxygenated in the lungs and then return to the heart to be pumped back to the rest of the body. So someone else asks, have you seen a correlation of dystonia, which is different than dysautonomia? So a correlation between dystonia uh, and POTS or dystonia and hypermobile EDS. So I can answer on the POTS question that we have heard of some patients having this, but we don't have any sort of population data to know, is, is this just background common in some people in the general public and a few POTS patients therefore have it, or is there any kind of relationship? So we don't have data on that. I don't know if Amanda knows offhand. I, I yeah. remember hearing something about dystonia and EDS, but I don't know if it's data or just sort of anecdotal patient conversations. Yeah, I definitely heard it come up in, um like in case reports with people with EDS. So I know uh, whoever is asking this, you're definitely not alone. I think it's it's uh, probably more common than we know, but I don't know of any, any larger studies that have uh, yeah. looked at the rates. So Amanda, if you want to, we might have some time to talk about some cognitive stuff. We got a question uh, mm -hmm. as part of your research. Have you found there to be cognitive impairments in patients with POTS and EDS? So that's an interesting question. I wonder if I have the slide to answer that. <laughs> if not, I'll just tell you. Um, let me see if it's at the end. Well, I'll just, I'll talk about it. So first off, well, this is a good slide to land on. There's only been six studies on cognition in POTS. So there isn't really a lot of data here. As far as I know, uh, my study is the first to actually assess cognition in EDS and POTS and EDS uh, and POTS without EDS. And what we actually found is the people with EDS and POTS did better than the people without with POTS without EDS, which um, I'm not really sure why that is. But I think if there's a mechanism for cognitive impairment in POTS, it's probably not related to EDS. Okay. Um, so here's a question. I'm, I'm not sure if this is meant for the whole population or uh, the dysautonomia population. Are, are you still doing the cognitive stuff? I didn't mean to interrupt. I thought you were summarizing. You summarized it. No, I'm, I'm not doing that. Okay. Um, so someone asked, what is the actual percentage of people who meet the 2017 HEDS criteria? The actual percentage of people who meet the HEDS criteria out of people with POTS? Uh, so this, um, the person asking the question didn't ask specific to POTS. Maybe they meant a percentage of the whole population, which I don't think we know, mm -hmm. um, because that would take a pretty large community study. Um, it would be great to see that. We really 
you know, I think the best estimate we have on the old criteria was one in 5,000, right? Yes, but I'm not really sure what that that was based on, and I think it was done several decades ago. Um, so I don't think we know the the prevalence um, based on the 2017 criteria and the normal population. In this study, our study was the first one to look at it, uh, look at this criteria in POTS, and we found 31% of POTS patients, which is a little higher actually than some previous estimates of EDS in POTS, but it's it's consistent with some of the studies. Right. And we're we're very confident in that. Um, I know a lot of times patients worry, did the people doing the screening know really know how to screen for EDS properly? So I think it's important to emphasize that uh, Dr. Frank Amano, who is kind of the queen of EDS research and the biggest, you know, sort of celebrity doctor in the EDS world, she is the one who did the screenings for this study. So we're confident that that percentage is accurate for that study population that we looked at. Um, so here's a good question. Um, my daughter only has a POTS diagnosis. Where do I begin to ask if she has EDS? What type of doctors would know about this? That is a good question. Um, so if they know about POTS or dysautonomia, they should know about EDS. So I think the doctor that is treating the dysautonomia would be a good place to start. If not, uh, you can try to see a geneticist or an EDS specialist, but the wait list there can be pretty long. Sometimes family medicine or internal medicine can be a good place to start if you have a family medicine doctor or pediatrician, um, if, the if, the, if the daughter's uh, adolescent. Um, because they're used to evaluating for lots of different things. Um, so if they're susceptible to uh, you bringing in the the form and asking them to evaluate for that, that might be a good place to start too. Well, just to clarify, when you say the form. Oh, yeah. Um, the diagnostic list. Lauren? How can something be heritable but not have a gene known to be associated with it? Okay, so heritable just means that it's inherited. So we know that there is an inheritance pattern within families. So uh, the grandparent had it, and a parent had it, and a child. That's a heritable pattern. However, um, when we look at genetic markers in the blood, there aren't any genes that are shown across the hypermobile EDS population. So we don't know if there's a genetic mutation associated with that, even though something is inherited. So lots of things are inherited that are not genetic per se, like dysautonomia, for example, doesn't have a gene associated with it, but we know that it runs in families. So here's a, a, a broader question besides, um, you know, sometimes people think of POTS as just the orthostatic stuff, the, the tachycardia, the lightheadedness, the symptoms that get worse when you stand up. But mm -hmm. um, the reason it's called postural tachycardia syndrome and not just postural orthostatic tachycardia, the syndrome includes all of the other autonomic kind of symptoms that these patients experience like GI motility, some people have pupil dysfunction or sweating problems. Um, so this uh, person is asking, are uh, GI motility issues common in EDS? Yes, <laughs> they're very common. So I think even uh, people with EDS who don't have postural tachycardia or orthostatic intolerance, which most of them have orthostatic intolerance, but anyway, GI symptoms are very common in EDS. And I don't know if there's data to support this, but I think people with EDS and POTS often have worse GI symptoms than people without EDS. I, I think uh, we have a little bit of data from the big POTS survey. Um, we didn't survey on the severity of the GI symptoms, but we, we asked patients you know, about different types of GI symptoms, nausea, constipation, diarrhea, vomiting, and EDS patients were more likely to report all of the GI symptoms, but only by a small percentage. You know, if, if people with POTS who did not have EDS, 
if 30% uh, of them said they had nausea, like 40% of EDS POTS said they had nausea. So it was both, whether you had EDS or not, we had way too much nausea, <laughs> but, but the EDS patients seem to be a little more likely to report additional GI symptoms. Um, so those mechanisms are not really understood. You know, is that because people with EDS have a worse autonomic problem? Is there something distinct about EDS regardless of the autonomic stuff? The EDS itself is causing a motility problem. We, we don't really have um, good data to know that right now. So much of, pretty much all of the questions people are asking are the same exact questions the researchers are asking themselves. And we're trying to work together with different research fields to, to bring together collaborative research projects. Sometimes, um, you know, like the best POTS researcher doesn't really have a lot of EDS expertise, or the best mast cell researcher doesn't really have a lot of autonomic expertise. So there's a real effort underway, underway to bring different specialists from different fields together to collaborate on these ideas. Mm -hmm. I think um, that's true, especially for the GI symptoms. I don't, like people often ask, is that an EDS problem or is that, I mean, clinicians ask this, not just patients. They ask, is that an EDS problem? Is that an auto, dysautonomia problem? They don't know what to attribute it to. And we really don't know. Uh, we don't know what causes the GI dysfunction in either of these syndromes. Right. And it, and it might be different in different people. I, I think for a long time we've accepted, the, or the research community has accepted that POTS is probably a common symptom presentation of a, maybe a whole bunch of different underlying causes. And, it, you know, something has caused your autonomic nervous system to not work right, and it kind of ends up looking like this thing we call POTS, but it might be caused by different underlying causes. And we haven't really had that discussion within the mast cell community or the EDS community as often. But you know, it's possible that these kind of loosely defined syndromes right now have all have different underlying causes or all have one unifying underlying cause that we just haven't found yet. And the analogy that I like to give is if you went back in history and you didn't know about diabetes but you met all of these people who seemed to have problems with eating and blood sugar, but you didn't have a name for it, you didn't have a test, and you didn't understand the biology of what was going on in their body, but you would see that these people, some of them were having heart attacks, some of them were losing their limbs, some of them were going blind, and you would say, wow, look at all these different syndromes happening. <laughs> but then you know, eventually, people realized these people actually have one underlying Okay, so Lauren Styles just called me. Her audio went out, but thank you for ev everyone for attending. Um, this webinar, I believe, will be sent out to all participants following uh, probably in the in the next couple of days. So thank you for participating, and I hope you learned something tonight. I think I actually just managed to log back in at the end, but just wanted to say thank you to Amanda and thanks to everyone who joined us. Thanks to our sponsors, Liquid IV. And we will be emailing out this video, maybe after a little audio editing, uh, to everyone who registered for the webinar. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.